High in the Andean Mountains of Peru, this land was once part of the Inca Empire. It's where the Spanish came 500 years ago, hunting for gold. And it's gold that brings me and a team from the New York Times to the town of Cajamarca, where the descendants of the Incas remain suspicious of outsiders to this day. We're here to investigate a growing conflict between the local people and one of the most profitable gold mines in the world. Buenos dias. Bienvenidos a Yanacocha. It's called Yanacocha, a gold mine run by Newmont Mining of Denver, Colorado, the largest gold mining company in the world. In the language of the local Indians, Yanacocha means Black Lake. But the lake is long gone, a casualty of this massive mining operation. Today, Yanacocha is spread across more than 60 square miles at altitudes as high as 14,000 feet. How many billions of dollars are invested in this site? Oh, we're close to $2 billion right now. I met Brant Hinsey, the general manager of the mine. You know, we are currently the largest producing um, gold mine in Peru, in South America, and currently in the world. So far, Yanacocha has produced $7 billion worth of gold. We were given rare access to what is known as the gold room. We're smelting molten metal. This is to protect against any other vapors. It is here where the ore is melted at a temperature of 2,000 degrees, and the gold is separated from impurities. The liquid gold flows into molds where it forms into bars. And it emerges as a crude brick weighing 28 pounds. Each bar is worth more than $180,000. There's a tradition among gold miners. They say if you can lift a brick with one hand, it's yours to keep. Just before my visit, Yanacocha celebrated the pouring of its 19 millionth ounce. Here's our 19th million ounce of gold. But behind the company's success story is a dark and troubled history with allegations of corruption and bribery. It goes back over a decade and happened here in Lima, the capital of Peru. It's a story that provides a rare behind-the-scenes look at how a multinational company does business in a developing country rife with corruption. It begins in 1994 during the presidency of Alberto Fujimori. Back then, the original owners of the Yanacocha mine were Numat, Buenaventura Peruvian company and a French government-owned company, BRGM. The partnership collapsed when the French tried to sell part of their shares to a competitor of Newmont. Newmont and Buenaventura went to court to stop them. Billions of dollars were at stake. So Newmont sent their top troubleshooter to Peru, Larry Kurlander, a senior executive and former prosecutor. The French government was behaving inappropriately in the litigation. This is the first time that Kurlander has spoken publicly about the case. In fact, I have, with my own eyes, seen a letter from Jacques Chirac to President Fujimori asking for his intervention in the case. So what do you do? Well, you can do two things. You have two choices. You can lay down and be run over by the freight train, or you can start the fight. I chose to fight. The dispute went all the way to Peru's Supreme Court, which was notoriously corrupt. Kurlander claims that the French were trying to bribe Peruvian politicians to influence the judges. We're at extreme disadvantage. We have in this country the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which prohibits American companies from paying any sort of bribes. And so Newmont wasn't paying any bribes? Absolutely not. The French embassy in Lima was deeply involved in the case, but the former ambassador, Antoine Blanca, denies they paid bribes. 
to your knowledge, did the French ever pay bribes to any judges or anyone in the government? No. Never? Never. Myself? Never. People under my control? Never. So who paid the bribes? If there is a Newmont, no? certainly. You believe Newmont paid bribes? I believe. I believe that. I can't affirm it. You can't prove it. I can't prove it. Kurlander says the French can't prove it because Newmont didn't do it. Yes. What we wanted to do was level the playing field. That was extremely important to us. We knew, I mean, I was very confident that we would win on the merits. But if that there was inappropriate behavior, we couldn't win. Larry Kurlander's campaign to win the case would lead him to the notorious Peruvian spymaster, President Fujimori's right-hand man, Vladimiro Montesinos. He was the man to know in Lima, Peru. Mirko Lauer is a leading Peruvian journalist. Vladimiro Montesinos was and is a crooked lawyer who made a short career defending drug traffickers and who became, for all practical purposes, the man in charge of the Peruvian army, of the Peruvian intelligence services, uh, President Fujimori's main advisor. This is Vladimiro Montesinos in action. Peru's intelligence chief secretly recorded most of the meetings in his office. Many of these videotapes were later leaked to the press. They revealed shocking behind-the-scenes footage of a corrupt government. The videotapes show Montesinos cutting deals, bribing officials, and handing out bricks of cash. He had corrupted almost all of the Peruvian army, almost all of the Peruvian politicians, most of his relatives, the governing party, definitely, a few diplomats. This man had as a, as a sideline the sale of privileged information and the peddling of political influence. Uh, this is where I would think that Newmont uh, comes into the picture. The secret recordings reveal that Newmont's Larry Curlander met with Montesinos here at his intelligence headquarters as the case was being deliberated in the Supreme Court. In this audio tape recording, Kurlander is asking Peru's intelligence chief for help in dealing with the French. Larry Kurlander says he had no choice. He had to meet with Montesinos. Because, because of the position he occupied. Now, when you were meeting with Mr. Montesinos, before you went to see him, you must have known something about who he was, what his methods were. I heard two things. One is that he could be terribly ruthless. Two, that if the French were to be stopped, he was the only one in Peru who would dare to do it. During the meeting, Montesinos offers his assistance through an interpreter. And then the two men part with a pledge of loyalty. When you say on the transcript, I want a friend for life, and he responds, you have a friend. I, I, I don't remember that precisely, uh, but there was a context surrounding that uh, where he said that he would help and... Uh, uh, I'm not sure of the exact wording of it, uh, to be honest with you. But in substance, that's what I said. Montesinos was not the only one Kurlander lobbied. He also persuaded the U.S. State Department to come to the aid of Newmont. Our role was to tell the Peruvian government we want the, the playing field level and that the Peruvian government knows that the United States government will be watching. Peter Ramiro was then the Assistant Secretary of State in charge of Latin America. You actually called Vladimir Montesinos? I did. How uh, many times did you call him, by the way? I, I, I think it was one or two times. On the phone, what kind of guy is Montesinos? 
Uh, I seemed to be uh, a nice enough fellow. Uh, uh, seemed to take what I was saying um, as um, as important. The French say that unlike the Americans, they refused to deal with Montesinos because he was corrupt. So you're saying Montesinos was a criminal? I a criminal, of course. And he was America's man? Well, he worked for the CIA. He was a CIA man. According to former CIA officials, the agency was paying Montesinos' secret police organization at least a million dollars a year for more than a decade. Here he is seen throwing a farewell party for the CIA station chief in Peru. And on yet another videotape, Montesinos discusses the gold mine case with the same CIA agent, the man in the middle. And in this, the most revealing of all the videotapes related to the case, Montesinos meets with the Supreme Court Justice who will cast the deciding vote. He explains that Peru needs U.S. support in a border dispute with Ecuador. A week later, the judge casts his vote in favor of Newmont. The French are forced to forfeit their stake, and Newmont gains a controlling interest in the Yanacocha mine. You, you understand the, the implications here. You seeing Montesinos, Montesinos meeting the judge, and you win. Not a single person asked for him to influence the outcome of the case. No one at any time, to my knowledge, on our side ever did that. Looks like the United States government went to the secret police chief, maybe didn't ask him directly, go talk to the judge, but that's how he interpreted it. It's regrettable that that's how he interpreted it because every single message that we conveyed was make sure that judges are able to decide on the merits of the case. Now, if he interpreted that as being, we want uh, a favorable decision for Newmont, a U.S. company, that's regrettable. Not for Newmont. Not for Newmont, but for the, for the, for the purposes of uh, the rule of law, it's regrettable. Three years after the case was decided, Peter Ramiro left the State Department and immediately went to work for Newmont. They thought that, uh, that I was an activist individual that could help them, particularly as it relates to community-based programs and that sort of thing, and I worked for him as a consultant for about 18 months. <laughs> when the Montesino secret videotape surfaced on Peruvian television, they led to his downfall and the collapse of the Fujimori government. Vladimiro Montesinos was arrested after fleeing the country and brought back to Peru to stand trial on dozens of counts of corruption. Now, looking back, Kurlander says he regrets meeting with Montesinos. It is what it is. And the fact that you're in a country and you're forced to deal with a guy like this, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. In Peru, the special prosecutor assigned by the new government to investigate judicial corruption under Montesinos was Ronald Gamara. My theory is that both tried, in all the media, to obtain a favorable favorable result. But only one of the parts got to Montesinos, and that was the one that won. Montesinos has never worked gratis, even when he does favors politically. Siempre tiene una ganancia económica. 